I'm Tiffany D. Thomas, um, council member for District F, and I appreciate you for joining us for our very first virtual community input meeting um, for Super Neighborhoods 20. So if you live in Tanglewild, Westmont, Piney Point, Briar Meadow, uh, then this meeting is for you. Uh, and we appreciate all of the input that we've received so far. So initially I wanted to have a face-to-face -face meeting with the residents so we could introduce um, and give you an, an update on what was happening in the, in the office within the first 90 days, but also to receive some of your input. Uh, and so talk about a first 100 days, we have the coronavirus and um, we are on restriction throughout the city, but the work must continue. So we wanna be able to provide that to you. And I also wanna acknowledge um, my staff that's on the call. Um, we have Long Nguyen, Ida Lee Navarro, Sherelle Duncan, and Torrance Atkinson, some of those names you're familiar with. Next slide. And I believe we have, I don't know if she's on the call yet. Um, she is. Um, your HISD trustee, before we get started, I did want to introduce her and give her an opportunity to um, share any um, pertinent updates around HISD. District F is large and we take in two school districts. And I know in the past, a lot of the conversation was dominated with about ALEAF ISD. Um, and I'm a proud graduate of ALEAF ISD, but I am very clear that there's an another community on the other side of the Beltway. Um, and so um, trustee, Holly is on the phone. She represents um, several schools within that area in District G and in F, um, particularly uh, Piney Point and Emerson Elementary. And so I see she's on the call. So I want to um, unmute her and allow her to bring some um, updates to you. Thank you so much, Councilmember Thomas. Can you hear me, everybody? Yes. All right, thank you so much. It's a pleasure being here with you at your community meeting today. I just wanted to give a couple of Im uh, important updates regarding HISD. Um, many of you have already heard that the district is going to be closed until further notice. Um, we were originally going to, not originally, these plans are, are always a work in progress since there's a lot of new information and different mandates and updates that are happening on uh, the real time hour. So um, we were going to go back to school April 10th. We know that the times don't allow for that. So now right now the school is, is district is closed until further notice. So we will see when we will reopen. In the meantime, our priority to, is the district is, is safety, health, um, nutrition services, um, making sure that we get that back online, which is coming on April 6th. So I know there was a, a pause in our food distribution services across various sites across the school district. We are uh, relaunching that initiative starting on April 6th. And they're predominantly distributing food at secondary schools, um, some middle schools and high schools across the district. When parents, families, and the community come to those food sites, they'll have enough food for three to four days, all right? Um, and they're rethinking how, you know, there was a pause there because of the, we, we wanna, wanna make sure that they're safely distributing the food in the district, right? So we're excited that that's going to be, um, happening. I know that there are also some COVID-19 testing sites in partnership, I believe, with the city of Houston at Butler Stadium and at Del Mar, uh, right next to the HISD central office on um, uh, West 18th Street. Um, what else on the HISD front? We're, you know, wanting to make sure that our students are able to get the wraparound service supports and the nutrition uh, support that they need. So that's why we're relaunching. Um, many of our schools have wraparound service specialists. This was an, a board driven initiative from 2017. And by 2021, all of our schools across the district uh, will have a wraparound service specialist. In the meantime, what does that mean? It means that we have uh, folks that are centrally supported, right, but are on the ground at the different campuses that are organizing some of the mental health, psychological supports, community, uh, other uh, counseling services and things of that nature to provide to the students because students, we wanna make sure that they're safe and healthy so that they can receive the learning. And uh, HISD also kicked off its at-home initiative, which is a distance learning program. 
uh, across the district. Our high school students have laptops, but our middle school and elementary school students, it differs from one school to the next. We do have an equity gap there. It's something that's top of mind for the board. We have our next board meeting a week from today, and these things we will continue to be asking uh, of our superintendent about updates. Um, so any of these updates and things that I shared to you, you can get more detailed information on the HoustonISD.org website. There's a COVID-19 landing page, and there you will see where the uh, distribution sites are because they differ from one day to the next. So you do have to be informed if you want to take advantage of uh, the nutritional program that's being deployed across the district. Thank you so much. And, I, and for the point of conversation for everyone, um, Trustee Villaseca and I have been in conversation about the congestion and the traffic around Emerson Elementary. And so she and I plan on following up uh, specifically with the Tangle Wild uh, neighborhood um, once we are released from our homes to um, really work through some of those discussions. Um, she's independently uh, been doing some work around some of those issues. And so once being elected, she and I circle back around that. So we're still, we're working on that. And I know that's been, an, it was an issue for quite a few of you um, that I heard during the campaign trail. So trustee, thank you so much for those updates. And we'll make sure that we include that in our follow-up tonight. Thank you. So just a little bit about the district um, uh, and you'll see our contact information. Uh, we are an open office and we wanna make sure that our contact information is readily available for everyone um, when it's necessary. Um, and also mine, uh, my direct email. And I know in the, the past, sometimes council members seem, uh, their contact information seems elusive, but I do check my email and I do answer my phone. And so I do see my calendar. So I want you to feel uh, very free to uh, shoot us an email. We do check um, our general inbox as well. And the, the data that we put are just about District F um, is on our city council page, which is based off the census data. And just a, a plug, we are a day after um, US census, which was April 1st. And so if you have not completed your census form, it took me less than three minutes on the internet. Um, you should have received your um, mailer by March 12th. And um, since we are staying at home and sheltering in place, now is a good time to do that. And so just to let you know a little bit about District F, we have three super neighborhoods. What is so unique about Super Neighborhood 20 is that Super Neighborhood uh, 20 serves three um, districts, uh, District G, District F, and a portion of District J. Um, so it's really a hodgepodge of this part of town. And so we wanna make sure that we can share information because y'all are all neighbors and it all makes a difference. Uh, another reason why we are working through our super neighborhoods, uh, you know, while campaigning, a lot of people had, um, you know, recommendations about, oh, you should have a task force and another committee. But super neighborhoods are, uh, you know, in 2000 when then mayor, uh, former mayor Lee Brown, uh, one of the things he instituted was the super neighborhoods in, since 2000 for actually 20 years. And the purpose of these uh, of the super neighborhood is to inform the city of needs in their community. Um, so instead of creating another layer and another organization and another committee, uh, we wanted to infuse information with the current structure that's already in place. So in our newsletter, you'll notice uh, standing, we'll have the standing meeting of every super neighborhood because we want residents to know that they can be involved in something that's already established and we don't have to create anything new. And so I'm um, just a snapshot of the HOAs and the civic clubs that are a member of Super Neighborhood 20 and the um, groups that we plan on communicating with in the future. So um, a quick coronavirus update. Um, Hopefully many of you received the emails and what we're trying to do is after a major press conference um, where information is pertinent that we um, share that out to the community so you can have it that it's accurate and you can be informed and communicate and make adjustments for your own household. Um, so the order has been extended through April 30th. Um, Governor Abbott um, extended that off order what's different about this new extension is that he has designated churches as essential um, locations rather so um, 
technically, if you would like to attend church, you can. At council, we encouraged on Wednesday, we are encouraging our senior citizens, we're encouraging everyone just to continue to comply with the stay at home. Um, Houston has not yet peaked. We expect our peak month to be in May, the first week in May. Um, so uh, that's one of the reasons why schools are closed throughout the state until May 4th. Uh, there's no shortage in the food supply, in the food chain, uh, senior hours um, are continuing with many food chains such as uh, Walmart, Target, uh, Fiesta, Food Town, uh, Dollar Store, and um, just continue to practice the social distancing. I know the parks was a, a, a sticky point for a lot of people, and so I take a, a walk. Um, I try to take one every morning, but so since we've been home, I've been looking at the city parks. And what we're doing is that if they're, you know, young kids at the park playing basketball, not practicing, um, creating space between each other, we're taking down the basketball nets. Um, and so we're doing what we can with city parks. And I know the county has put up large signs at most, all of the county parks, um, encouraging others to do the same. So that's the uh, major update in terms of that. We will provide, I think in the next slide, we have some numbers to show you. Um, also with this order, the evictions remain. So there will be no evictions through the month of April 30th. What this means is that if you need to file an eviction, you can. They will not be processed until after April 30th. Um, there's an exclusion for um, if there's a domestic violence, trafficking, if a tenant is being violent um, or is a danger to themselves or their neighbor, the property can, of course, uh, evict that person for public safety reasons. But for at, at this moment, um, that's where we stand. And that's um, and from a city perspective, we're not cutting off any water, any utility, um, and anyone that's um, on a, a housing plus voucher from the housing authority, there will be no evictions there either. So um, as council, we're briefed every evening, uh, closer to about 11 o'clock with some updates. Um, and so this will change tonight, but just so you can have an idea of what's happening in the city. And this is only reporting the one city location. So um, Trustee Villaseca is correct. There are two city locations and we have two county locations. Uh, and then Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee has one at a United Methodist um, facility on the north side. Um, these numbers do not include our um, uh, private testers or such as, for example, Legacy Health Clinic. Uh, so uh, since the last report, so since when, this is Thursday, so since Wednesday, we've had an additional 81. And I believe the press, uh, press release went out earlier today. We had two additional deaths. Um, and so um, currently we do have beds available throughout the TMC. Um, the beds are specifically for those who need the ventil uh, ventilator or need to be in critical care um, to be managed. And so um, if one is testing positive, uh, the uh, recommendation will be for them to go home and to continue to quarantine. Um, our testing sites are at no cost. Um, and um, anyone presenting with symptoms, um, they are able to go to those two sites. Um, we are not publicizing those locations ongoing due to HIPAA, and we don't want to violate um, those, those potential patients that might be positive um, during that time. But those are the two locations. And then the two locations in the county is um, the Berry Center, and then there's a, a, another one, and I'll get the second county one, and I believe Katie has one as well. All right, next slide. So the mandatory, um, Katie and Baytown. Yes, that's right. Thank you so much. Um, they have sites that are stood up to um, as well throughout the region. So the mandatory 14-day quarantine, um, this was also included in Governor Abbott's order. So if you have come from any of those states or cities, then you will need to be quarantined for 14 days and DPS will be involved. And there's a series of, of documents one must sign um, because they've all had um, enormous peaks within their um, um, active cases. And we're trying to mitigate that 
and identify where people have traveled and where they um, where the community spread is happening. So um, this is a, a new addition to the governor's order. Next slide. So um, the mayor's typically doing a press conference after every other day just to update. Um, but um, this is the specific information that it's helpful for you and we'll share these slides. Um, but 832-393-4220 um, is our call center. You can be screened um, and then directed to the testing site. Um, what's um, important to note is that you can't just show up to the testing site. You must have an authorization number. So if there, if you know of someone, a neighbor, a friend, or family member, um, sh please share this information with them so they can be processed accurately. Um, and we're asking um, for people not to drop other people's off, other people off. Uh, we don't want you to potentially uh, catch, uh, uh, catch the virus. Um, so we are prepared to test 500 a day at both sites collectively, 250 at each day. Um, for the next few days, um, we have uh, made, uh, yesterday we voted to draw down on the $5 million from our economic stability fund, um, similar to what we did uh, for Harvey in order to respond to uh, PPEs and purchasing equipment. Um, and these dollars will be reimbursed through FEMA. We've already received a $5 million grant from the Health and Human Services Department, which we use the majority of those funds to make sure that our um, our, our medical staff and first responders and materials will come into the city of Houston while waiting and working with our federal partners. Any questions around this information? We have no questions in the chat box. Wow. Anyone, did any, ra any raised hands? We have no raised hands, but okay. anyone? I'm I'm sure people are tired of hearing about coronavirus, so that makes sense. Next slide. Okay, so um, this is really what we wanted to present to everyone. So will additional test sites be open? We do have one question. So um, as it stands, we are not sure. So um, uh, Ms. Carolyn asked, will additional test sites be open? Um, right now, this is what we have. So in the region, we have two from Harris County, two from the city, Katy, Baytown. Um, I, I, I'm not sure where the locations within Fort Bend. When we look in the top, uh, that, you know, that, that county area, um, they're all identifying sites. Um, it's limited based on the number of tests that we can receive. Um, and because this thing is changing by the hour, uh, the tests are coming back a little quicker. Um, and that does not include, again, if you went to your primary care physician and or Legacy Health Clinic, which has been testing, your private hair, um, your primary care physician might send you to Quest Diagnostics or LabCorp, and they're charging about 150 to 180 for those tests. So that's not, so you, it's not limited to just city sites. Our two sites and the two, excuse me, and the two county sites are supplements to what is um, already taking place um, through medical care providers. In addition to the one federal site that um, Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee um, opened in mid-March. So um, currently we would have like five in our area. Um, so, and we're testing about, I think yesterday the number was like 178 we tested. So, so our district F priority. So I campaigned on, on, on these four um, basic principles. Um, and these four basic principles um, really were curated throughout the year of campaigning. And so we transitioned these from just not just talking points, but to our priorities within our district. Um, one is public safety. We want um, safe neighborhoods. Um, you know, we want to be able to identify those crime areas, and we've been receiving a lot of that information. Economic development. Um, one thing that's really important to me is that we bring in high skill, high wage jobs to match the high skill and high wage education being offered in our public school system. Um, and there are pockets of our zip codes, pockets of areas within District F that have high unemployment rates, um, particularly with our adult workforce. And so that's something that's really important to me and what we plan on focusing on. Uh, neighborhood revitalization. 
uh, it is, you know, the, the, the baseline is if we don't clean up our area, business won't come. Um, we want young families to, we want young families to choose our homes. We want them to start their uh, life and family in our community. Um, but we have to have some type of amenity and quality of life and uh, maintained um infrastructure in order for them to do that. So those are some of the things that we're working on. And essentially we want all of the city services that are offered, we want to make sure that they're extended out to our district. Um, last but definitely not um, least is um, develop real meaningful and uh, meaningful partnerships and some intervention and some youth programs. Um, we don't really have much for young people to do out here. But in addition to that, District F is one of the lowest performing districts um, participating in the mayor's summer jobs. So before Corona, one of the first things we attempted to roll out was enrolling young people between 16 and 24 into summer job programs, um, where there are 15,000 jobs uh, that we have reserved in the city um, through corporate partnerships. Um, so they can have personal and professional skill sets. Um, and when young people are busy, then they're not being mischievous and we know how that goes um, and that connects to public safety. So those are the four priorities um, which align to the committees that the mayor has appointed me to either chair or be a, a required member of. Next slide. So what are some of the things that I would hear throughout the year of campaigning and while just observing because I actually live in, in, in District F, I'm a resident and a homeowner, um, our streets, our drainage, beautification, illegal dumping, um, you know, after hours clubs, human trafficking. Uh, and it's kind of centralized around these areas, which would fall within one of those four um, um, priorities. And so that's what we are focusing our um, first hundred days on addressing so we can communicate to you, either we're gonna, res we've resolved the issue or we're working on a plan to do so. And if we're at a delay, we're able to communicate why. So our funding projects. So this is the good stuff. So when I, you know, uh, just kind of watching previous council members and just this, how the city operates period, um, you know, projects would just happen in communities and I never was clear about how or why and how they were designated or prioritized. So um, one of the things that we're doing is being very um, transparent about our council district service funds. So I'm not sure how many of you are aware, but every district member receives $750,000 in district service funds. 250,000 of that is what we call unrestricted dollars. 500,000 of that is from Metro. And so those dollars, um, so those dollars are designated for specific things such as sidewalks and um, speed bumps, speed cushions, et cetera. Um, so when you look at a district that has a, a little over 250,000 people, it's essentially like a, a dollar per person. And just to give you context, um, when CEO Bradford, he really led, when he, um, he really led uh, council on creating council district service funds. And initially council districts had a million dollars. Um, but we have 750. And so the mayor's perspective is, if you're not using your dollars for your projects, don't ask for more. So when you break it all down, we really have a small budget, but we can do really meaningful things. And what we've already initiated in fiscal year 20, which ends June 30th, are projects that have been um, submitted in the past, but not adopted. So one of the first things that I did was reach out to our super neighborhood leaders and request for um, CIP projects or recommendations, or if there were any neighborhood uh, projects that were requested. So we can look at the cost and what could be adopted within this fiscal year. So when I came on, we had close to like $121,000 remaining out of the 250 unrestricted. And we immediately initiated and approved speed cushions, sidewalk repair, um, 
all types of, you know, drainage improvements um, so we could um, spend the money and initiate projects before the next fiscal year. Now, our capital improvement plan, and we're going to um, show you some of the projects that are in your neck of the woods, but in the past, council members essentially lobbied for their project. And sometimes that worked for the community and sometimes it didn't. It could have been a pet project or not. Um, and so the city years ago transitioned from council members necessarily choosing their projects to going to more data-driven um, type of tool to look at what are the real needs in the city um, from a capital improvement plan. So um, our yeah, um, CIP meeting was uh, canceled on March 24th due to Corona uh, being a city uh, project. However, I will tell you that the mayor is rolling out a um, citywide street repair and drainage project. And so we're in the process of identifying where District F falls within that and the projects within the district um, that would impact that. And I know we've already initiated one in uh, uh, Carver, Car Carver Quest and Piney Point, but there's some others coming soon. Next slide. And just a note, 311 is really important. So uh, for instance, District C, they receive over 30,000 311 calls yearly. Um, and those 311 calls really drives where Department of Neighborhood puts resources because they look at the need. And District F doesn't have the same um, type of interaction or participation with 311. So if you don't have the app, please download the app. I still call 311, but if we generate more interaction and participation with that number, um, then from a city uh, designation of funds and resources perspective, they're able to designate that more to our area because they see the demand. So this is the process of how council district service funds um, how this happens. And so you can have an understanding of the process once you make a request. So if projects are essentially under 15,000, um, more than likely the department um, that we need to meet with, well, we will have their support. So let's say you want, uh, you're asking for updated playground equipment for the neighborhood park in your area. We would then initiate with the parks department and ask if this is something that they can, one, designate staff for if they have time and the resources to do so. Um, because the department has to purchase, um, have to, has to perform the job and pay for it first. Once the job is done and they pay for it, we then transfer the funds to the department. So um, they have to be able to agree of the level of scope and the commitment to this job. Um, once there's mutual agreement, it goes to legal. Once it goes to legal and they say this is something that's appropriate for these funds, this, these are tax dollars and it's approved, it goes to the mayor's office for approval. And I'll tell you, there's been no pushback on any projects thus far. Um, we continue to work with that department in understanding when they plan on initiating the timeline and the expectation of completion so we can communicate to you in the future about you know, if there's an inconvenience in terms of street repair that you'll be familiar or when you can anticipate the completion so you could celebrate something like a, a new park. Um, and then we have a, a monthly meeting where we uh, monitor the projects. So in another effort to be transparent and to centralize information, we created a council district service form. And you'll see the uh, link at the bottom and Sherelle's gonna show you what that is. It's a Google document that we created that just allows us to capture all the information because um, unfortunately um, I didn't receive any historical information or documents when I assumed this role. And so we want to make sure that um, if nothing else, we leave it better than we received it. And then this just helps us organize our work. Um, and then I'll make an example of Briar Meadow uh, HOA, for instance. So there, there was a resident that uh, requested 
um, speed cushions, and then the HOAs were, HOA was requesting another project. And so if we're able to um, centralize information, we'll be able to communicate because there might be an instance where you have several individuals in one neighborhood requesting the same thing. So if you scroll down, it's just an easy capture of your information. This document will be available um, as a standing link within our uh, newsletter, but also on our council district uh, website. You'll be able to see that. You may not know the amount requested, um, but if you know at all information that you can um, upload is very helpful to us. We'll always um, confirm the project cost on our end. Um, for example, if you are doing a um, like Super Neighborhood 25, they do a empty uh, empty sh uh, shelter project with the getting pets spayed and neutered. Um, and we have already committed to partnering with them. If you have other corporate funds, for instance, or if you were doing a neighborhood cleanup and you had your company doing matching funds and something else and you wanted the city to um, support, um, you would include that so we can know that there are other partners and then also that there's no conflict of interest on our end. And then you would just upload your budget for the amount um, requested and then we will review and then communicate to you um, next steps. Uh, project start date, project in time, because um, what we want to be able to do is at the end of the year be able to articulate back to the community on where the council district service funds were spent and why. So you'll be able to identify your topics if it's sidewalk, beautification, capital improvement, um, and just a note, capital improvement um, items come from the mayor's office and not necessarily the uh, district office, but we do share that information um, with public works or the, or whatever the um, designated um, department, but we'll be able to um, report back and then keep a track of the projects we have in our district. Any questions about that? We have no questions in the chat box. Mm -hmm. Any raised hands? No raised hands. What? This is great. Okay. All right. So um, currently, these are the current uh, council district service projects in Super Neighborhood 20 from District F. Um, and so we have... Uh, we have already initiated this project to begin in 2020. And um, yes, Ms. Carolyn, we're gonna um, talk about your project. I think we have it on the next slide. Um, so we're gonna initiate this project. So this was sent, uh, in, um, I think a couple of months ago and it was approved. So this will begin, I wanna say May 20, May 2020. Um, and we'll share that information so you can know what happening in your area if you live in the Tanglewild area. So um, the SWAT project. So our SWAT department, it's a little different than capital improvement. So we have, you know, some issues where water is just kind of draining in one area. Um, the SWAT division, they're responsible for bringing um, items or streets or sidewalks or drains up to baseline um, so they can be maintained until there's a, a real need to do an extensive capital improvement job. So um, Carver Crest subdivision, that drainage project that Ms. Carolyn mentioned in the chat box is one of them. And then they have already initiated construction. And then we are, have we have already, um, for the Westerland drainage project, it's currently in design. And so with Carver Crest, uh, we had the contractor meet with the HOA, share information, um, we um, informed the residents, and I think we only had two neighbors where there was a direct impact in terms of, you know, their, um, their driveway. But what we plan on doing when there's any type of major project, introducing the contractor so HOAs and Civic Club can kind of keep that relationship um, and we can kind of close the loop on that. We want to be proactive in communication because y'all have to live with this work um, and live with the product, the project throughout this time. And this is the project in Westerland. 
So capital improvement projects in super neighborhood, particularly for District F, is the Briar Meadows subdivision area drainage and paving project. And that will be initiated next year in 21, in fiscal 21. So um, that's getting ready to move fairly soon. And I think we have some images of that as well. So this is the notorious drainage where the water just kind of sits in that neighborhood. And, um, and just so y'all, if, you, if you're kind of visualizing the map, uh, Tangle Wild is the most Western and super neighborhood 20 South of West Timer, then it's Piney Point. It's wait, it's Tangle Wild, West Mop, Piney Point, then it's Briar Meadow. Um, and Briar Meadow butts up right there of West Timer and Hillcroft on the, uh, on the other side of Voss. Uh, and so that uh, project will be completed in 22, and that's an extensive project, and I think it'll be a tremendous difference in the area. Any questions about that, those projects? There are no questions in the chat box and no raised hands. What? Okay, maybe we're getting better at this. Or maybe just Super Neighborhood 25 just had all the questions. Okay, next slide. All right, so our proposed planning. So um, as you see, we received um, $250,000 in unrestricted funds. And one of the things that I want to propose to us using those funds for is for a hot team. And I want to give you some background on how funds were used in the past. So um, we have an illegal dumping uh, um, issue within District F. And the um, Department of Neighborhoods has only 36 code enforcement officers. Dallas has three times that amount. So um, in the past, the previous administration, council administration, would um, underwrite HPD. So HPD has a major gifts, I'm not a major gifts, a major crimes division. And within major crimes, they have an environmental task force team. I might be messing up the nomenclature with that. So uh, there would be uh, 20,000 subsidized for overtime. And then um, that team would um, identify uh, target areas of illegal dumping and whatnot. And so, um, but it, that was only, that was in addition to their work of their primary function. So a hot team, District B and District K utilizes a team where the Department of Solid Waste would through a temp agency or a work agency identify hourly employees and they will be specifically for district f so this is what this allows us to do um, the 125 is not the um, most accurate price um, but you can have up to four people um, and so we need since we have an illegal dumping issue within our area we need a dedicated team to doing that and this is what this allows us to do you if you identify something in the area you could call the office we get the information within 48 hours that's picked up and it's documented this is what it does not give us it does not give this team um, citation authorization. So in conversation with the Department of Neighborhoods, I've talked to them about subsidizing a code enforcement officer's salary out of the 250000 so we can have citation ability within District F. Um, some of our commercial properties, um, you know, that's, I went walking yesterday evening and saw, a whole, I mean, this morning, a matter of fact, I saw a whole couch just sitting in the driveway. Um, a whole mattress, rather, in fact. And so um, we have to um, put our hands around, you know, the issue around illegal dumping in our area and, and start tracking these bad actors. Um, so we'll present to y'all um, better numbers. So I just want to give you an idea of how we plan on spending this money so we can see immediate improvement within our, in our neighborhoods and um, start doing some citations where we can start tracking them. Um, a part of the issue, what I'm learning is that a lot of problem areas within District F, they weren't necessarily reported. So it's just kind of a common thing that people are not pleased with a certain area or the upkeep of an area, but it's not documented with 311. There are no citations on file. Um, so what seems like a very clear sign that this is not appropriate. Um, no one's actually called to have it documented. So we're gonna we're working on having something in place where we can um, get the ball rolling with our bad actors. 
So our community events. So one of the things that we want to roll out is community cleanups. Um, I believe that if we change the culture of our of our community, um, uh, other things will come. And um, we, again, circle back to super neighborhoods to ask what are the problem areas, the immediate ones in your area. And super neighborhood 20 identified cross view between Westheimer and Richmond. And we've had a couple of emails um, from business owners, particularly apartment complex around the illegal dumping in that area. And so what we plan on doing is in partnership with some corporate um, sponsors. There's some that have reached out that said they would like to, you know, partner with the district office for events like this. Identify these areas where, as a community, we cross promote and we get out there and we, you know, clean up the area and we do what we can do for ourselves. And the city office will support in partnership with Keep Beautiful Houston. And so we will work on um, those dates collaboratively. Um, and so please let us know if you're interested in participating. We would love to have your, um, we would love to have you out there with us as we um, clean up our neighborhood. Um, and I think, you know, I, I don't believe everyone would lead on it, but I believe a lot of people would participate if they knew this would happen, was happening. Also, the people's pop-ups. Um, every fifth Saturday, it's our intention to go into the community um, around a different topic. Uh, uh, we were at ready for May with our uh, youth in education, focusing on the mayor's summer job program. But due to Corona, we have rolled that Saturday, and we'll have to figure that one out. But in May, hopefully, we're in we're out of our homes in May. We are going to focus on financial literacy. We're partnering with IBC Bank. Um, we're going to focus on healthy eating. We'll be at a Spark Park, I think, at Judson Robinson Library. Um, the 31st, workforce development, job training, and then we'll figure out the youth and education. And so this is just a, a way for us to test and kind of get out in the community and see what are the needs of the people and what are they hearing and then how can we make sure that those city departments are out here responding to some of those needs. Next slide. So I mentioned I gave the plug around census. Um, we do have District F numbers out. And so we're going to um, synthesize that and, and send out so you can know how we're doing. Um, we are ahead of Dallas by a, a very small margin, if that means anything to you. Uh, but in terms of council districts, District D is leading the city in terms of re uh, return forms. So I just want to remind that you can complete this form online by phone or by mail. Uh, the, um, the U.S. Census has canceled all field operations through April 1st. Um, so at this point, you shouldn't have anyone at your door um, or requesting information it, um, because, you know, it, a lot of times when stuff like this happens, people, um, fraud happens and we, you, you don't have to show a social security. You don't have to purchase anything. You don't have to give up any type of personal information. It took me three minutes. And so hopefully you've received your card and you'll do the same. So please notify your neighbors and your friends that um, no, you, you cannot take this on Facebook. Someone um, raised this issue at, a, at another virtual meeting that young people are taking this via Facebook and that's not accurate. We want you to, um, um, we want you to uh, complete it on .gov and not uh, .com. That's the accurate website. Okay, let's stay in communication. Um, we send out uh, bi-weekly newsletters, uh, weekly email notes to um, all super neighborhood and to HOA leaders. So if you are a leader on the HOA or your civic club and you're not receiving our weekly notes, please reach out to us. And what those weekly notes include is essentially um, high level items of meetings that we're having, um, information that's rolling out very quickly from City Hall that you can share with your colleagues. We are in a, um, we're working to do a better job of including um, agenda items so that y'all can pay attention to that and um, committee meetings. So for instance, uh, there's an ordinance that's coming up for vote. I want to say next month, uh, around human trafficking, there will be a partnership between area hotels where there will be mandatory training for employees. And so they are presenting that to the Public Safety Committee, which I'm a member of. 
Um, and so we will send that information out. So if you would like to watch the committee, ask questions, if you would like to submit questions to me that I may ask on your behalf, feel free to do that. And that's one of the reasons why we send that to our HOA and super neighborhood leaders so they can um, kind of get us some information speedy so we don't have to fill up your inbox. Um, we do have a social media presence. Um, and we do have a visual newsletter on YouTube that we um, will encourage you to watch and enjoy as well. Here's our contact information, it's our general inbox. Um, all of us have access to that email and um, our telephone number and our council website. We have one comment in the chat box. Ms. Moss says, there is a trash issue that isn't specific to District F. I would suggest public messages to inform citizens how trash that goes to storm drain affects us all during rainy season. Yes, um, and uh, public works, that in, um, they have something rolling out. Um, and it, I, I think depending on what side of District F you're on, like there's literally, you know, a couches in, <laughs> um uh dressers sitting out on the corner where i go walk and so i you know i think one of the things that will be helpful is that how we communicate 311 in the future because a lot of people don't realize to your point that when they throw that chip bag down the drain what happens when they throw these items into the street and how this messes with our drain so we'll definitely take that into consideration and see how we can amplify that in our communications Any other question or statement or comment? We have no other questions or raised hands. What? This meeting was only 48 minutes, wow. Well, I won't hold your time. I appreciate um, um, for you getting on this call and sharing your comments and your feedback. If you um, ha are delayed and wanna communicate later, feel free to reach out to us. We're more, we will respond back and send an email to um, everyone with the questions and we will send this uh, slide deck and it'll also be on our council uh, page if you wanna review it in the past. Um, and so let us know if you wanna visit the office after Corona virus and we would love to have you. And we'll um, be in practice of sending community, um, our committee meetings and our public session. And if I haven't shared this, I'm chair of housing and community affairs for the city. And so under housing and community affairs, we have solid waste, veterans, homelessness, and a dotted line to um, complete communities. And so currently I am, I'm having conversations with property owners within District F around evictions and making sure that um, renters have uh, alternative means for paying their rent. And I am happy to report that um, a, a couple of the big partners, uh, the big property owners in F um, were very willing to have a discussion and they're doing all they can to make sure that um, hardworking people can stay in their home during this time, um, particularly because it's so important for census, but as they figure out where their um, next check is happening, uh, as we all know, 6 million people People file for unemployment. Um, from a city perspective, we are very clear that this is hitting um, not only just the restaurant industry and workers and business owners, it's everyone's is feeling this pinch. And so we, um, the mayor sent a memo out to limit spending. So spending has ceased at the city in terms of, you know, unless it's very essential, uh, but no supplies, none of that's happening. And the finance office has already started to uh, adjust the budget um, so we can prepare. We had a budget meeting two days ago on Tuesday and we have not received our receipts for February, uh, March or April for our revenue uh, in terms of sales tax, but we do anticipate a huge drop. There's a committee that the mayor um, has created um, and I believe Council Member Letitia Plummer will be leading that effort where we're going to convene council and some business owners, some real, you know, everyday business owners, not the big box people, so they can advise us on how the city works with them um, in terms of how we um, uh, turn the page as we are anticipating um, 
uh, rival levels of recession as 08. And so we're preparing ourselves for that. So I just want to, you know, be honest about the conversations we're having at City Hall. Um, and then two things, um, the Houston Library Foundation and the Civil Service Commission for the city. Um, they, uh, the Board of Commissions reached out to me and they want to have um, District F represented on those two boards. Sherelle did send out an email earlier. If you didn't receive that, we will send that information to you. We do not have any District F residents on the city boards and commissions. And so it is my intention to make sure that we have our residents that are working hard representing us um, on these city boards where a lot of uh, recommendations are made um, and decisions are made. So if you're interested, please send your email to Sherelle. Um, copy me by April 6th. I know that's a quick turnaround, but we want to make sure we have enough resumes and CVs that we can recommend so we can have the right people in the right spaces. So um, if you want to have a conversation, um, property, yeah. Thank you, Nanette. Yes, you're absolutely right. Um, if you want to have a conversation about that, please look at the city board website in the description of the roles and the responsibility. We'll love to have a district F, um, representative there. So without that, I want to thank you again. I appreciate your feedback and we'll be in touch. I hope you all stay safe and healthy.